Hi there, Lindsay here, The Frugal Crafter. I hope you're having a great day. Today we're going to take a look at a new-to-me brand of watercolor paints. This company has been around for a while, and I have heard of the company before, but I really didn't know much about it other than just the um, opinions I had in my head or preconceptions that I had in my head. And, and the name Tri Art, and I don't know if I'm confusing them with another brand, but when I think of Tri Art, I think of temper paint, I think of um, industrial uh, art supplies, such as like art supplies that are uh, often sold to schools. I don't know if I remembered seeing some of these, this brand in the uh, one of the places I taught. I used to be the art director at the Hammond Street Senior Center, which was part of a larger nonprofit. Um, so I think that might have been a vendor that we would buy from or something. But for some reason, I think of Tri Art as scholastic, not necessarily scholastic grade, but a, like a um, a kind of industrial art vendor. And I'm not exactly sure if that's the case because I did go looking on some of the websites that I used to order from for that job and I did find Tri Art Supplies from NASCO and Blick and um, and whatnot so maybe that is the case but what we're going to look at is actually their watercolors and the watercolors are fairly new to the scene just from the uh, the research I was doing on their website. Um, Tri Art I think was formerly called Kingston Art Supply and these paints came from a viewer named Wendy. She said she bought them at a store called Art Noise which is also owned by Tri Art. Um, doing some little online research that I saw. They're a Canadian company and I thought I'd review this product because my viewer was kind enough to send these to me. She hadn't heard much about the paints but she enjoyed them and she bought them locally in Canada where she's from. So I thought this might help folks that live in Canada. I know uh, supplies can vary in prices so much depending on what country you live in and if the Tri Art paints are a much better value for you in Canada. Um, I thought I would give them a review and kind of compare them with the paints that I'm used to using that are available um, in the United States and also in Europe. Because I know sometimes you're like, oh, I want to try those paints, but man, they're three times the price where I live. I wonder if these are just as good. So um, I'm not going to say I can defin definitively tell you everything about the brand because I can't, but I'm going to give these 18 colors that I was sent a going over and give you my thoughts on them. So um, I did a couple paintings. I did some swatches. I worked with them for a couple of days and uh, we're going to get into it. Um, I also want to fully disclose that I'm a human, so I can have opinions and I could um, you know, air this way or that way. I've been in kind of an art funk the last month, so I just want to put that out there. So if I'm not feeling like maybe if I was in a super um, peppy inspired phase, I would rate these higher. So I just, I just want to put that out there. I've not much has been impressing me these last couple of weeks. So um, I do want to put that out there, uh, but I'm going to be trying to be as unbiased as possible with these paints. So I'm going to start off with their swatches that I did here. Now she sent me a paper. She was very kind, put this, all this information out on paper, listed out the colors that she had sent. There are two paints that she put in half pans. Tri Art does offer a, um, a cake style watercolor as well as three different size tubes. Um, so she had swatched them out in this paper and my first impression seeing that was like these look really streaky um, and I didn't know what to think but I didn't want to prejudge the paints until I'd actually used them myself but she also listed down the pigment information and also the names that Triart gives the colors. So what I did when I swatched these out I just wrote the pigment numbers down because different companies will use different names on their paint sometimes. Um, I tend to go with the most uh, traditional names. Those would be kind of like the names that brands like um, Windsor & Newton, Rembrandt, um, Grumbacher, kind of the, the old legacy European brands. Those are the, the names I, I generally will call a paint because I started painting in the 80s and um, we always were referred to the traditional names of paint. So uh, I, that's that's what I always refer to, but I will say the pigment numbers here as well. So I try to keep everything as baseline as possible. Like I said, I'm human, not perfect, um, but at least this is, a, this is one review you can reference when you're trying to decide whether these paints are for you or not. You can look up other reviewers' reviews and see what other people say and, uh, you know, form your own opinion that way. And as always, I recommend if you're not sure about a brand of paint, try a tube or a pan, a couple colors, uh, see what you think before you go whole hog and buy a bunch of paints that you may or may not like. So let's look at the paints we have here. Um, I just swatched them out. What I did was I divided up the paper into 18 spots. I drew a wide permanent marker line. So I would have a, 
a line across each of the uh, swatches. And then I painted a gradated swatch. So I kind of started off with my darker color at the top and faded it down. I found that the paint dispersion was really good. Um, it was very easy to get a graded wash, um, very easy to re-wet and lift. Um, they, some of the paints were a little crumbled in the half pans, but I didn't have any issues re-wetting these. Um, the viewer that sent these to me said that, you know, they're very thirsty paint. You'll want to soak them. I didn't really find they needed much soaking. I did spray them before I used them, but I didn't find them to be really difficult to re-wet or anything. Um, maybe because of the crumbling. Um, when that happens, when you get a crumbling paint, and this is really handy also if you like to make a dry gouache palette, after your paint starts to dry, you've squirted them in the pans, if you press them down with your fingers, um, that's going to compress the cracks together so they're more likely to dry hard in the pans so that they don't fall out. So there's just a little tip for you, especially if you like to bring your gouache on the road. If you take the time when you're drying the paint down to do that, that's going to really make it um, uh, really make it a lot nicer for you and make and also let you get more pigment into the pans, which is which is really nice. Uh, if you can press it down, you get all the air out and um, and it works out really well. So let's just go through our colors here. After I was all done swatching, I did the uh, the graded swatch, then I did a glaze swatch. After that was dry, I did another line with that same permanent marker so that we could see the difference in transparency. So if like on this color here, we see that that line, that thicker line looks a lot lighter than the line on top, you can say, okay, there, I'm seeing a little bit of a haze. I'm seeing the paint through that. Um, there really isn't a lot of issue with that here. I'm not seeing much opacity. It's yellows, a lot of times yellows will have a little body to them. Not a gritty chalkiness, but I can see a little opacity in those two yellows, also in that red. But that's not something that I'm concerned with. For the pigments that are used, nothing there is concerning. These tend to be pretty finely milled. So if you like a smoother, less granular paint, judging by these 18 colors, I think that's what you're going to get because we do have an ultramarine blue. And while there is some granulation, it's not aggressive. And um, if you're trying to avoid granulation in your work, I think these paints might be nice for you. Um, even their PBR7s don't have much granulation. Um, it almost looks like this PBR25 has a little bit of granulation. Um, but I don't know if that texture is a true granulation or if it was just applied strangely or the, uh, this is cotton paper. So I don't know. It does look like this little texture there, but, uh, that might have a little bit of granulation, but nothing, nothing aggressive, nothing that I would say, don't use this if you like a smoother, a smoother paint. So here we have, uh, our naphthol red light. That is a nice, smooth, semi-transparent paint, PR112, a little bit of haze on the glaze swatch. I didn't notice much in the gradiated swatch. Um, so like our glaze would be mass tone. So if you're using it pretty thickly, you, you will get a little bit of a haze. Next we have PR170, that is naphthol red medium. Your naphthol reds can be a little fugitive in watercolor. You often don't see a naphthol red in a watercolor. That's often used for like acrylics or oils where they have a more robust binder. Um, but I know I've seen those, like, I'm thinking, is that pyrrole red? Do they use that same? So that's why I kind of, like, he are hesitant to say the the names are giving these colors. And I want to just kind of go with pigment information because the names can be a little a little misleading. Here we have a PV19 quinacridone red. It looks like a permanent alizarin crimson. It's a nice, not too blue, cool red. Uh, it would be good for for kind of like a true a true red. Um, a little bit on the cool side. We have PY74. This is um, our live yellow medium. We have PY3, which is your Hansi yellow light. They're calling it Alari. <laughs> I have a hard time with that word. Alari yellow light, but it's your it's your Hansi yellow light in common terms. PY150. Um, they're calling it nickel azol yellow, which is a pretty common name. Sometimes it's called green gold. We've got our Indian yellow here, PY110. I love all of these single pigment colors that we've hit, hit so far because when you start with a single pigment, you're going to get less, um, you're going to get more saturation of color. So if you've got a one pigment yellow, that's generally going to be more saturated, more intense than a mixed yellow. So if you take a single pigment yellow and you mix it with a single pigment green, you're going to get a really vibrant green in general. You're going to get more pure color. Here we have a uh, Prussian blue hue. So instead of PB27, they're actually using PB15 colon one with PV23. So it's a purple and a like a phthalo blue. Um, 
so that's going to be giving you a staining, um, smooth Prussian blue hue that should not fade. Now, sometimes Prussian blue will kind of turn brown if it's hung in the light, but then you put it in the dark and then it recharges. So um, if that, if that, I mean, a lot of people don't like to put their paintings for a nap. I think it's come really quick. So that, that was so funny. I don't like to put my painting for a nap in order for it to be, for it to be uh, vibrant. So, um, that, that that might be a better solution for you. Here we have our ultramarine blue PB29, not very granulating. So if you want to avoid those granulating ultramarines, that might be a good choice for you. This color is a cerulean blue hue. I avoid this color. Any Often you'll see it called sky blue, sometimes manganese blue hue. What it is is phthalo blue mixed with white. And this also has some ultramarine blue in it as well. I don't, I would rather just take the blues that I have and mix white to it if I wanted to do that. Um, I mean, it worked fine in a, in a sky, in a blending test that I did, but that's not a color I personally would have picked. But just know that when you're, make sure you look at the pigment information when you are purchasing paints from this brand, because you may, you may see the pigment and you may be like, oh, I love that pigment. Or you may be like, oh, I have that and I'm not really crazy about it. I think I'll skip that color. So I definitely would do that versus going by the names. Just look at the pigment numbers with this uh, with this brand. If you're into pigments, um, everybody's different. You know, I know not everybody cares about pigments and this that's fine. You don't have to. That's what they pay the scientists for. If you're not interested in that, I mean, you should know like kind of what's in your palette to make sure it's not going to fade. If you don't want it to, if you're going to sell something and you want to make sure it's not going to fade or you want to hang it on your wall and not worry about it fading, you know, you, all you need to know is what you're buying. How are, how are the pigments in those paints? How is that light fastness going to hold up? You don't need to know everything about pigments, but uh, if you're curious, you can definitely find that information out. I like that there's pigment numbers. Then we've got some browns. We've got um, burnt umber. PBR7, which I love a PBR7, Burnt Umber or Burnt Sienna, and this is Burnt Sienna, Burnt Sienna PBR7, which is an actually quite a warm um, orangey Burnt Sienna for a PBR7. So that's kind of interesting. That's a, that's a nice variety between those two to get PBR7s with such a variety. And then we have this PBR7 down here that has, it's called Transparent Brown. It actually has that kind of like green undertone, almost like a Van Dyke Brown color to it. Almost like a, um, like, it's almost like a raw, like a more strong raw umber, honestly. Um, that, oh, actually, you know what? That is a raw umber. I'm sorry, that's raw umber. This is Transparent Brown, uh, also co called Benzinadine Brown PBR25, which is a beautiful, um, it's more transparent than this burnt sienna, it seems. It's got a little more life to it. Maybe that's just the texture in there, but uh, but it's pretty. I don't think you need to have both of those on your palette, but um, but it's definitely a pretty representation. Then we've got a PR122 um, magenta, quinacridone magenta color. We've got a mix here, Thalo Tur turquoise, which is PB15 colon 3 plus PG7. Personally, I would rather have, like, instead of that color, I'd rather just have a phthalo blue. Rather than that color, I'd rather have a phthalo green. And then I could probably even omit that color because that's a mixture of PR101, which is a brown that looks very similar to this, plus PG7, which is a green that's not quite as blue as that. Um, this is called Sap Green from uh, Triart, but this looks more like a hooker's green deep to me. Um, so, you know, that's why I said don't don't buy a paint because you're... You're looking at the name from this brand. Look at the swatches and look at the pigment numbers, so you know. You, so you get what you're expecting. When I think sap green, I'm looking for a more warm, earthy, lively green. Like I want a green that looks like moss growing in the woods. That's what I'm going for when I'm looking for a sap green. And then last but not least, we have a very beautiful paint, uh, Payne's Gray, which is a mixture of PBK seven, PB fifteen colon three, and PB twenty three, which is a pretty. Um, customary Payne's Gray mix. It's it's really lovely. Um, you can always take one of either your burnt sienna or burnt umber, mix it with your ultramarine blue, and get a granulating neutralized gray. Um, so it just depends on what you want. This is going to be more transparent. This is going to be a little more staining, and it's going to be better for like if you want to to do a grisaille, grisaille underpainting and then glaze over it. Although this is cool leaning, so just kind of keep that in mind. It's not neutral. Um, but it's not bad. It's a, it's a nice assortment of colors. Um, they have a much larger array of colors. Um, I don't know exactly how many colors they have in their line. They sell them in four different formats. You can get a 4ml cake, and it looks like, like a Crayola um, pan of watercolor. So I think when I first 
heard about that watercolor, I think I just assumed it was student grade or, or children's grade or scholastic grade, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the the way that it was formatted. It looks like it looks like a kid's cake of watercolor. And they have these, these lovely bamboo holders where you can buy your different pans of watercolor and put them in. The pans of watercolor range from a um, from starting at like I'm thinking they start at about nine dollars, eight or nine dollars for the for the pans. The five ml tubes start at five dollars, and they go all the way up to about thirty dollars for a twenty two ml tube. And they also come in a twelve ml tube. Now, looking at the packaging, I have to say, and I don't have any of it to show here because um, Wendy had had put these in half pans and sent me a, an assortment, so I don't have the packaging to show you. And I haven't seen them available in any stores around here. They are a Canadian company. Um, I think that the tubes and the the cakes that they sell look very um, low end, like they look very student grade to me. And I think it's maybe just the, the white plastic look of the tube and the pan. It just it just looks like um, like something that would be supplied to a school. So I think that almost colored my opinion of these paints. So I try to kind of put that aside. But when you look at those tubes, they're going to remind you of kind of a budget brain, but they're not. They are actually um, I don't say super expensive, but they're definitely more expensive than than they look as far as like looking at them in their packaging. So that would be one thing I would I would recommend to the brand. Maybe the bamboo palettes are beautiful. I love the bamboo palettes. I it just maybe it's just the artwork on the packaging. It just looks very dated and very um, very low end in my opinion. But it doesn't really matter what the packaging looks like. Uh, what matters is what's in the paint. So um, very smooth, glazes beautifully. Um, easy to rewet. I have no problems with this paint. Here's a couple little paintings I did with them. I want to just do kind of a really, really watered down, loose, watery floral. Fine, it worked fine. The colors bled where I wanted to bled, bleed. I was able to layer them up. No issues whatsoever. They performed as expected. Um, I did this little sketch of a of a cocktail. Performed as I expected. No issues. No problems. I glazed fine. Um, and then I was actually, I was working on this, just little landscape, but I, and I loved the way the sky had come out, but then I just kind of, I don't know, lost interest. Like I said, I've been having a heck of a time these last four or five weeks, just getting inspired. Nothing like, you know, I can't get no satisfaction. Nothing <laughs> that I'm painting is like kind of scratching that itch. But uh, so anyway, yeah, I crapped out on this painting, but I love the sky. So I thought I would just kind of blend those sky colors again. I used the, that color I said I don't like. I actually, it was very easy to control on a sky wash. I have to say that. Um, that's probably why they made it. And the reason why I think they're doing a cerulean blue hue versus a cerulean blue. Cerulean blue um, is P, uh, PB36 and that's a cobalt based blue. And a lot of companies are getting rid of their cobalts and their cadmiums and other heavy metals because of environmental reasons. And I think because of expense, they're expensive to produce and they're becoming less popular with um, with a lot of artists. So uh, it's a great so it's a great excuse for companies to wipe out those more expensive pigments from their line. Um, I don't like it. I like that per that that color personally. I feel like I dispose of my paint water responsibly and with watercolors it's not like you're using that much of it that I don't think you'd really notice it in like an acrylic or an oil because you don't have that you're not using the pigment in such a pure form it's all in, encapsulated in oil or acrylic emulsion so you wouldn't really get the benefit of having that um, true cerulean blue but with watercolor so much of the personality is the attributes of those unique pigments and um, and not having that I feel is a disservice to watercolor. But, you know, I also know equally as well, there for, for everybody that has my opinion, there's another artist has the opinion where I want to do the least amount of harm absolutely possible that I can do. And I want, I don't want heavy metals in my paints. And I can completely respect that. And, uh, um, and that's the paint for you. That's a great paint for you because it did. It didn't get my sky muddy. This is a really watered down version, but um, it performed really well. It was easy to control, nice and smooth. Worked great in the sky. Um, so I used that. I used that red, and I used that yellow. So I was just kind of playing with those three kind of warm. They're uh, fairly warm primaries, even though that's a cerulean blue hue. Cerulean usually is a little more green leaning. I think the the ultramarine blue in that mix warmed it up a bit so it was kind of like a, a warm triad there but very clean uh despite the white in there still very clean and i have no qualms with that um so 
do I recommend these paints? Um, I would have to say yes. I think that if you, especially if you are in Canada and these are a more affordable option than say ordering a legacy brand company from Europe or from America, I know like M. Graham, I'm not gonna lie, M. Graham is my favorite watercolor. Um, and, and I think part of that is, is a bias that I have. They were probably my first my first real dive into professional watercolors back in the late 90s. Um, I worked with like pretty inexpensive paints. Like I was using uh, Marie's China Colors. That's what I learned on when I was seven back in the early 80s when I first started taking watercolor lessons. Then I bought Cotman tubes. I used Cotman for a long time. Um, and then I would just kind of buy a tube here, buy a tube there. You know, but I I like I doubled down. I went hard with M. Graham because it was a brand new brand that our local art supply supply store brought in, and I just went I went hog wild. I said, "What what kind of deal can you give me if I buy one of every tube except for the the black and grays?" And um and he like gave me for like four dollars a fifteen ml tube. Of course, this was the late nineties, but still, I I went whole hog, and I have not regretted it. And I have rebought colors as I've used them up and they're just such a consistent beautiful brand made in the USA they're my favorite but I, I think a, a good deal of that is just kind of like a fondness and a nostalgia that I feel for that brand um and but anywhere else other than America you're gonna pay a lot for that paint in fact in the USA now the prices are kind of high on that paint it's a very high quality paint um so if you're in Canada and you're like well this is a very reasonably priced paint is it worth it for me to pay twice, like double and buy Daniel Smith or buy M. Graham or buy Windsor Newton or buy Rembrandt or whatever brand that you want to get? And judging by these 18 colors, I would say no, as long as you go by the pigment number rather than the, the, the paint name, because I don't think the names correspond to a lot of the customary pigments. That, uh, that you know and love if you're trying to avoid the granulation and go for a smoother paint. Uh, judging by these 18 colors, I would say you would be happy with this. They're not the cheapest paint for the quality um, for an American. And I was looking at their website and their prices were in USD. So they're not the most affordable paint. I think it depends on where you live. You know, if you live in Germany, Schmink is gonna be way cheaper for you. If you live in the UK, probably Windsor Newton will be cheaper for you. So you've got to, you definitely have to weigh the value. To me, I would put these kind of quality wise on par with Turner watercolors. They actually kind of remind me of Turner because they don't have a lot of aggressive granulation. Some Turner colors do granulate, granted, I'm just going by pigment to pigment, like if I'm comparing that way. Um, but like pigment load and stuff, they remind me a lot of Turner. They're a little bit more opaque in some of the colors than say like Mission Gold or like if you really want to avoid granulation and you want super vibrant color, I would say Shin Han, Mission Gold, those are really going to give you that. These reminded me the most of Turner for whatever reason. I'm probably, I'm quite familiar with Turner paints and they remind me a lot of Turner and I like Turner. Um, Turner is a lot cheaper than these though. Just in America, buying them from like Jerry's Autorama, Turners are going to be a lot cheaper than the Tri Arts. Uh, my recommendation for these would be um, give them a try if you're if you're someplace where it's a good value. I would like to try their their pans. They're that ba I'm a sucker for a cute novelty palette, and they have a couple. They Blick sells one that's got um, I, I don't know if they're half pans or quarter pans. It's a it's a bamboo palette, but they're not the the pans that I see for sale on their website. They're smaller. They've got an assortment there for sale. Um, you can order from the TriArt website in the United States. Well, the prices came up in USD, so I'm assuming that I could just place an order there if I wanted to. Or you could try um, a larger art supplier to see. I had a hard time tracking these down from any place other than their website, though, as far as like buying a tube here in the United States. But um, I think this, this review is probably going to be the most useful for Canadian viewers that are looking for some information about this about this line of paint. Um, I think the quality's good. Just watch out for the crumbling in the pans. Um, don't judge a book by its cover. Don't judge it by the packaging. The packaging looks really low end um, and dated. You know, it does not look like a high quality watercolor. And hey, you know what? If the It's like, I don't want to offend a brand, but you know, if that can like make their product a little bit more better, it can make them market it a little bit better and maybe show it with fresh eyes because that you don't know sometimes you just you just need a fresh set of eyes on a product but I say yes they're good I think they're a little overpriced for like if I'm gonna pay the prices on their website here as an American they're overpriced I can get much better deals for a similar quality of paint but um 
I think they're decent paint, you know? I, I think I've given you enough information to go by. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask me. I don't think I'm going to be the best person to answer a lot of tri art watercolor questions because these are the only colors I've used. Um, they have customer service contact information on their website if you want to reach out to them. And if you've used tri art watercolors and you want to uh, share your experience in the comments below, please do that. That's going to be really helpful for folks looking to purchase this paint because um, the more information they can crowdsource, the better. So if you've used them, please let us know what your experiences are. And I hope you found this helpful. They're, they're fine to use. I've been in a funk, man. Um, maybe on a different day I would be, you know, wahoo, sunshine rainbows. I, I think they're fine, you know, I, they, they're not outstanding, but they're not bad by any stretch of the imaginations. They're, they're solid. They seem to be a solid uh, quality of paint anyway. So there you have it. If you enjoyed my reviews, I would appreciate a thumbs up, maybe share it with a friend. And um, if you're not a subscriber and you'd like to be notified when I have new videos, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and you know, maybe it'll work. It doesn't always, but uh, I post videos about four times a week, reviews on Monday generally, and I uh, hope to see you back. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.